G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. We are a few weeks away from the 2024 draft and I thought I would revisit a format that I did. Well, I've done it a couple of times previously and I thought we'd do it again this year. And this is mapping out a bit of a guide for the 2024 draft for more casual fans. Throughout this channel, I have this constant tension between servicing fans that are super engaged and super into footy and also acknowledging that some people use this channel as a way to keep up with footy without necessarily dedicating all their other spare time to watching footy. So in this video, I'm gonna give you the general characteristics of this year's draft, what you really need to know ahead of the 2024 ballot. So in this video, I'm going to go through, you know, talking about what are different ways to value a certain draft. You know, one of the biggest cliches that you see in the draft space is that this year's draft is weak compared to next year's, which is a super draft. That is actually not something you'll hear a lot this year because this year's draft is considered quite strong, but we'll get into the specifics of how it is strong and in what ways it is not necessarily strong. We'll go through the extent to which this is compromised and you know if you're not aware of what compromised actually means i'll also show you every team's draft hand both this year and next year and i'm also going to provide a whole heap of links to different resources i have you can find current draft orders you can see next year's draft order as well we'll go through a few picks at the top end that i think will ultimately shape the draft and some things you need to know about next year that will help inform decisions around this year's draft so i hope this video is helpful and not necessarily just to people that are novices it might help fill in a few gaps for others as well. So let's just get straight into the meat of this. Um, and this, let's start with the fact that this year's draft is considered strong. Now you might've heard the term super draft quite a lot. And this is one of the most overused phrases about drafts. And I don't think it strictly applies to this year either. What is a super draft? Well, 2001, uh, is a considered the super draft that the AFL has ever seen. Now, if you out of curiosity, by, by all means, go have a look on Wikipedia, the draft that year. You had guys like Hodge and Ablett and Chris Judd was pick three. There's heaps more. I think Steve Johnson was that draft. Was James Bartell? I'm actually forgetting off the top of my head. If you consider that the standard for what a super draft is, I don't think we've seen anything since. However, it is also very important to note that the, the true quality of a draft can really only be assessed about 10 years after the fact. So perhaps we've had a super draft. 2018 is looking like a very strong top end. But anyway, really, we're just talking about the quality of a draft. Now, what, what are ways to assess the strength of a draft? It's, it's not one dimensional. There are a few different considerations you have. First of all is the top end quality. Now, what do we mean by that? The best players of a draft to what extent do they have superstar potential? Because that is something that changes every year. There is also the depth of the draft and the evenness of a draft. So some years you'll get drafts with really strong top 10s to top 15s. And then after the top 30 picks, there seems to be a little bit of a lack of AFL level talent. By contrast, there are also years where the top end is not so strong, but there is a great depth and evenness to the draft. Another way of assessing the quality of a draft is the amount of talls. So what do we mean by the amount of talls? Obviously the amount of good AFL level quality tolls. This is something that fluctuates. It's not the same every year. Some years have a mountain of good key position forwards and backs. Some years are good for rucks. Other years, there is absolutely no good young ruck talent. These are all important factors for teams looking at drafts while they compare it to their needs and see what is worth investing in and what's not. The other way to assess how good a draft is, is also a fairly new modern one, and that is how compromised it is. So what do we mean by compromised? The AFL has somewhat recently introduced an academy system. There is a next generation academy for most teams, and there is a northern academy for teams in the rugby states of Queensland and New South Wales. Now, without getting to the nitty gritty of all the rules there, essentially you'll have some players in a given draft who are already attached to a given club already. So we're talking about father sons and academy picks here. So in this year's draft, we have three, I think that could potentially all be in the top 10. And we'll talk a little bit about next year's draft in particular, but that one is known for being potentially the most compromised draft ever. When you factor in the top 30 talents, if you listed it like that, how many of those are already attached to a club where they only need to match a bid for them? This is another important factor when assessing drafts. So let's talk about this draft specifically. Compared to everything I just said, how does this draft shape up. So guys, just a quick intrusion to let you know that this video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp and they're on a mission to make starting therapy easier. I think there are some misconceptions about the value of therapy and one of those is you need to have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety before you can seek out therapy. I actually think taking the step of seeking therapy and seeking help is actually a sign of strength and self-awareness and helps prevent problems before they arise. And it does take a bit of courage to acknowledge when you need help and taking steps to improve your mental health. So rather than thinking of therapy as something you use when you've got a diagnosed problem. Think of therapy as a tool for personal growth. It helps you understand yourself, you 
can develop healthier habits. It also provides a safe space to talk. Not everyone in their life has someone that they can go to and express to them what's on their mind. Or perhaps there is someone to talk to, but you don't wanna deal with the fear of judgment or perhaps feeling like you're a burden to them. And there's also the fact that you'll actually be getting guided help from an expert, a mental health professional. So as I said, as the paid partner of this video, BetterHelp's mission is to help starting therapy for you easier. Starting the process with them is really easy. All you have to do is fill out a questionnaire and in most cases, you'll be matched with a therapist within a couple of days. If the therapist that you get doesn't feel like the right fit for you, you can easily switch to another one at no additional cost. They are very careful that the therapists that they get are well qualified and there's also a customer service team if you have any issues. So if you are someone who is struggling and thinks you could benefit from therapy, click the link in the description or go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. You get 10% off your first month. By doing that, you would be supporting the channel, but you also get 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. Thanks guys, let's get back to the video. This draft probably doesn't constitute a super draft, which to be honest is an arbitrary term that has been defined by no one, but it doesn't have that top end punch of previous years. And I would even go as far as to say, this is me putting on my opinion hat. That's not a thing. My opinion, which I think does reflect what a lot of what you know the pros out there are saying, is that this year's top end is comparatively weaker than previous years. However, what it does have is a much deeper pool of talent. And I've heard people much more educated than myself in this space say that a pick in the 40s this year might be the equivalent of a pick in the 20s last year. So these are all important decisions, particularly when it comes to trading selections. I'm also going to, once again, don my opinion hat and say that if you combine the 2023 and 2024 drafts and say that Sam Lawler, Thin O'Sullivan, Jagger Smith, some of the top prospects in the 2024 draft, if you put those in the 2023 draft, how many of those would go in the top five? And I, at the moment, I'm not sure if many of the top five, if any at all, would be displaced by the prospects in this year's draft. We're talking Harley Reid, Colby McKercher, Jed Walter, Zane Dozma, and Nick Watson. Now that's not necessarily a hill that I'm going to die on as far as opinions go, but some of the top players, I should mention Levi Ashcroft, Finn O'Sullivan, Sam Lawler. I'm not sure any of those cracked the top three of last year's draft. And I would say there's a considerable talent gap, particularly between Harley Reid and Jed Walter and some of the guys in this year's draft. However, however, when you look at last year's draft, there seemed to be this clear belief that the top 30 selections, maybe even the top 25, was where the quality was, whereas this year it really evens out a little bit deeper than that. And by extension, you know, picks 40, 50, 60, they're still worth taking in this year's draft where in some years you see clubs stop taking selections early. A classic example of this is Melbourne in 2023. They traded pick 14, pick 27, and pick 35 to get up to pick 11. So they will hold simply pick 6, 11, and those were the only selections they would take in last year's draft because that's where they thought the quality was. It seems less likely that you're gonna see teams do that this year when there is a much greater spread of talent. I will also highlight that this year is pretty strong for talls. Now, you probably won't get too many talls in that top 10. Luke Trainer was a prospect that seemed like he could go top 10, um, but has faded away due to a variety of reasons. And maybe Alex Toru looks like a pretty safe bet to be a top 10 selection as a tall intercepting defender. But other than that, it's very midfield heavy. But, you know, as you get towards the late teens, the 20s and the 30s as well, I think there's a good variety. However, there is a caveat on that as well, because a lot of those guys are a little bit undersized. Like you've got the Whitlock twins who are both 200 centimeters, but guys like, you know, Shanahan and Toru, two of the other top prospects, they're not really full key position height and all of these are factors as well. You've probably got one really good quality Ruckman in this year's draft as well in Alex Dodson. So to what extent is this year's draft compromised? Um, a bit. I think that is just the nature of the modern landscape of drafting with the incentive that clubs have now to invest in their academies. We're going to see academies produce more talent. And my personal opinion, side note, I think the way the draft is currently may not stand the test of time. It may not be the way it is currently for much longer. That is a side note and possibly worth a video in itself. Um, and father-sons are a little bit hard to predict. There is a fair amount of luck. I mean, just because a, a guy's dad was good doesn't necessarily mean his son will be even a footballer, let alone a good one. But we've seen a really bizarre trend of real top end selections. Did Sam Darcy go pick two? Nick Dacos pick four. Will Ashcroft went pick two or three and probably could have gone pick one. Levi Ashcroft could justifiably be pick one in this year's draft. But we have three plays in the top 10 that are already attached to clubs. We've got Levi Ashcroft who will go to the Brisbane Lions in the first couple of selections you'd think. Isaac Kako may go in the top 10. That seems to be the group think right now. Leonardo Lombard, same, probably in that top 10, albeit the bottom end of that top 10. You got a couple of Camperiolis. So when we get the draft order up, if you aren't familiar, I'll show you every pick that every club has in a very clear way. You'll see that Carlton holds like 3, 38, 63, 68, 69. So all of these are obviously lining up to match bids 
for the two Campriolis, and they may go picks 30 to 40. It's unclear at this stage. There's also Sam Marshall joining the Brisbane Lions. So that's a healthy dose of the top-end talent already attached to clubs. And we've got a club in Brisbane who get one of the best players in this year's draft, potentially the best if you believe Cal Toomey, who ranks him at number one. They get him in a year where they won the Premiership. But anyway, this is not the time for that. And for the record, I actually like the father-son quirk. I just think it is a bizarre result. So let's segue into showing you every team in the league's current draft hand. Now, I will actually post a link to this in the description. Every year I use this guy, Law, on Big Footy as a resource. He updates it in real time and did a great job of updating it through the trade period. So if an actual pick swap happens between now and the draft, this will be updated pretty soon, I'd imagine. So yeah, the link for that will be in the description of this video. But without going through absolutely every pick, this is ordered by the total value of each of these picks. They're all assigned a points value, which only matters if you are matching in a bid for an academy or father-son player. So I don't need to get too caught up, but it gives us a rough guide as to who has the best hand in the draft. And surprise, surprise, <laughs> Richmond hold the best draft hand this year. If you follow the trade period, you're already aware of that. By contrast, you got Geelong who, um, you know, traded... 17 and 38 to get 45 back for Bailey Smith, and they're not really a big factor in this year's draft. So as a side note as well, I, I've made a few videos so far, and I will continue to do so around teams who could really shape this year's draft and really shake up the order away from what is currently just a pure ranking of talent, you know, from one down to 50, is going to be very different to the way the actual draft plays out due to clubs' various list needs, but also the fact that some teams hold multiple selections and might want to diversify their options. Again, I've done specific videos on Richmond, St Kilda, Melbourne, and potentially I'll do one on North Melbourne as well. Now, North Melbourne don't currently hold multiple selections in that top 10. However, they are a team that will be one to watch in this space because they pretty much are outspoken about needing talls. And at pick two, they could absolutely draft a tall, but the expected top handful of picks are all midfielders. So they have the choice of drafting a tall earlier than expected or trading that pick for two later selections and getting two talls. So these are all factors here as well. And uh, as I said, you can find my thoughts on each individual team, Richmond, St Kilda, Melbourne so far on this channel. Now let's take a little bit of a look at 2025. And this is relevant for this video as well and relevant for this year's draft. So I will get up the order that you can see there. At the top, we've got a club in West Coast who has invested heavily in the, well, in the draft in general. This may have been out of their control a little bit because Hawthorne only had future picks to trade for Tom Barris, but also there is a suggestion that West Coast are loading up those picks for a big trade target in Chad Warner next year. But as you can see, Gold Coast hold a stack of first rounders, and this is relevant as well because they potentially have next year's number one draft pick in Zeke Euland. So they're very well set up with picks in that space. You've got Essendon who hold two first rounders. I think personally, there is a good chance Essendon trade one of those picks back into this year's draft. So like I said, you can find the link to the 2025 mapping out of all the draft picks also in the description of this video. What do we need to know about it? Like I said, they say it might be the most compromised draft we've seen in our entire time watching the draft. It is also considered shallower, but with a better top end. Now there's a big caveat on what people say about a draft 12 months out, because things definitely do change. However, the current assessment from what I can gather Shallower doesn't have the depth of this year's draft, but the pointy end, the top end prospects might have a little bit more upside than some of the guys expected to go in the top handful of picks in this year's draft. I've also heard next year is pretty good for talls as well. So that comes into clubs thinking if they think they need to draft talls in this year's draft. If there is a knowledge that next year has a very strong talent pool as well, there's not necessarily as much urgency. One important thing to know about next year's draft as well, like I said, it is heavily compromised. The exact nature of how compromised it is, is it's a little bit early to really forecast that. But we're seeing a rule change around the way clubs are able to match bids in next year's draft as well. That is match bids on their Academy of Father Son prospects. So at the moment, like every pick, I think up until like the 70s has an attached points value that is now being dropped to 54. So only selections in the first three rounds will hold any points. This isn't just relevant to teams trying to match bid for Academy players because we can see over time clubs can trade later picks to move up the draft order with teams that hold academy prospects. So there is a mutually beneficial relationship there. You just got to be the right team in the right place with the right picks to trade with say a Brisbane Lions or a Gold Coast Suns in next year's case. So it could still be beneficial for clubs to hold picks in the top 54 of next year's draft to be able to trade with a Collingwood as well. Collingwood have Tom McGuan who is expected to go in the first round of next year's draft. And that also justifies the decision to trade 2025's first rounder. So all this is good knowledge to know as well in terms of anticipating which teams are likely to trade into this year's draft. Now teams such as a Gold Coast or a Collingwood, for instance, those are the two off the top of my head, 
that know they have top prospects in next year's draft, they are less likely to trade picks in next year's draft into this year's draft because that would just make it harder for them to accumulate points next year. Now, earlier in this video, I did highlight Essendon as a team I expect to trade into this year's draft. It's not a given, but this is more or less my opinion. But what they can do is once a bid for Isaac Kako, their next generation academy player in this year's draft comes through and they absorb all their later points, they can trade one of their two first rounders from next year into this year without fear of it being absorbed because the Kako bid has already happened. There's also all sorts of pick swaps that they can do up until the draft because they hold 28 and 31. They can trade those into the future so they don't get absorbed and then trade them back in real time. It gets a little bit messy trying to predict that, but I do think Essendon will be doing something in this space. It's also worth acknowledging that because of everything I said about the strength of this year's draft, there will be a premium placed on 2024 picks. So if you're trading a future pick 30, that might only be worth 40 in this year's draft for two reasons. It's considered quite strong. And secondly, there's always a premium you pay when you're trading into the present because you've got to incentivize a team to trade into the future. So that is my attempt at mapping out everything you really need to know about this year's draft, save for the fact that I, I didn't analyze any particular prospects. However, I am doing my best to do that at the moment. And currently on this channel, you will see that I've got a playlist where I do a profile on each prospect, some of the top prospects in this year's draft. I'm aiming to get it out daily until the draft. Just a six minute video on each prospect individually, also doing mock drafts and things like that and analyzing teams up until the day as well. So I'm doing my best, but I wanna make it clear, I am not a draft expert, and I don't know if I've ever really positioned myself as such. I just wanna make that clear. I will always position myself as a really engaged fan who's trying to make helpful content for other people. I've been doing footy content for about seven years now, and the landscape of YouTube in particular has changed. And a few years ago when I started making draft content, I found that there wasn't a lot of awareness out there. And, and nowadays there seems to be more draft knowledge and awareness from the average punter than ever before. So perhaps maybe the value I created a few years ago is not the same as it is now, but I'm just trying to make engaging content for you and try to be helpful. However, I also want to acknowledge a few other resources that you can definitely use to enhance your draft knowledge. So one of them, if you're not aware, is Cal Toomey. He does a phantom form guide every month leading up to the draft. And then his mock drafts that he releases right before the draft tend to be quite accurate. Toomey is pretty well connected and he does hear things and he is a great resource. There is also a great website called Rookie Me Central that I use. So all you have to do really, I mean, you can go to their website directly, but if you type in a prospect's name and AFL, it's usually one of the first hits and you find really detailed reports on each player. Further than that, there is a YouTube channel called Footy Stuff who creates compilations for players that are both sometimes highlights where you just see the best things that a player does on the field at the time. And sometimes it's, it's clips of every single possession. So you get a feel for their weaknesses as well. Great resource if you're looking to learn about players. Again, all you really have to do is search the player on YouTube. Further than that, there's some great content creators in this space, particularly Dylan Alexander. I think he's really popped off this year and it's great to see because it's well and truly deserved. So you're looking for someone for more in intimate knowledge of the draft than myself. Dylan is a great resource. So if you haven't heard of him already, Check him out. Pommy and Oz has also been really strong in this space. Daz Talks Footy, another guy who clearly follows the draft. So I'd just recommend to broaden your horizons if you're not aware of these guys already. Then of course there's fan channels as well. So if you support a certain club, I'm sure there's channels like Blue Abroad or Saints TV and others that I'm currently forgetting. <laughs> there has never been a better time to try and learn about the upcoming draft. Now, finally, I'll end it on this note. My only advice to someone who has followed the draft for 15 years, the first draft I've followed and got attached to was 2009. My best advice is trying to have an open mind and don't get too attached to a draft prospect before your club drafts him. I still fall into this trap every year, but if you lock onto a prospect that you really want and then you let yourself get disappointed when your club doesn't pick him, you will be sad and there's a good chance you're gonna be wrong anyway. That has often been the case for the players that I want. Anyway guys, hope this video was helpful. Let me know in the comments um, anything, any gaps you wanna fill in there, any talking points and any questions if I can help by all means. So for now, I'll say goodbye. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.